So it's one thing to know the steps of a blockchain transaction. It's completely different to understand what's happening mechanically, how these nodes, members of the network, come to a consensus of what transactions should be added to the blockchain. Now, it's really easy for a central server to do this because what a central server says is king. can execute transactions just like that. You do have the security risk. It's a little bit more tricky with a decentralized network. For example, let's say you want to go to a restaurant, pizza, lunch. You're going to think about a few restaurants and ultimately make a decision. Now, let's say if you're trying to go out to lunch with 10 different people, uh, that decision is going to be a lot harder to make because you have to get 10 people to agree instead of just one. And that is the problem that is, that is uh, faced by decentralized networks. So let's actually look at a miner real quick. Um, here are the components of the miner. You can see a better layout here. That's what it looks like intact. So miners, what mining is, it's essentially a race. So the Bitcoin protocol puts out an equation, and miners race to solve that equation. The winner gets the right to form the next block, to pick which transactions get processed. Now, why would they do this? What incentive do they have? Well, let's say you solve this problem, put together a valid block that is added to the blockchain. You get a monetary reward. So that's what keeps the network going. Interesting note about this machine. Um, mining generates a lot of heat. This is a pretty big fan for uh, it's such a small unit, but this is one of the problems that mining creates. It's very energy intensive. Um, well, another thing is mining isn't really exclusive. Um, it's kind of more egalitarian. Anybody can buy a unit like this. It's not too, too expensive. Become, part, um, become a miner on the Bitcoin network and compete in order to solve those equations, put together blocks, and receive Bitcoin as a reward. Let's look, let's use an example of how the network comes to a decision in order to examine that. So here's our decentralized network. Here's Charlie. Charlie basically is sending a transaction. Let's say he's sending money to his grandma. Uh, Charlie is just waiting for that transaction to be mined. At this stage, it's between the miner Alice and Bob. For sake of example, let's say one of those two uh, miners are going to win. They each have Charlie's transaction as part of their block. So who wins? Who determines? Who gets to put Charlie's transaction in a block? Well, the miner that wins the race. The miner that wins the race ultimately, and has Charlie's transaction, is going to add that to the chain. For example, let's, uh, let's look at a block. Uh, let's use these blocks, excuse me, in order to illustrate this example. For example, let's say we're down to two miners. We're down to Alice, miner one, and Bob. They each have Charlie's transaction in the block that they are compiling. Which one gets added to the chain? Simple. The miner that wins the race gets the right to put their chain onto the block. So if Alice wins, looks like that. Alice good. Alice's block is added to the chain, and Alice receives a cryptocurrency reward. And then Charlie's transaction is project is is. Charlie's transaction is processed. Uh, another miner, Bob, miner two, might additionally also have Charlie's transaction in the block he's trying to produce. So if, Char if Bob wins, Charlie's transaction still gets added to the chain. Now, let's say that Alice has Charlie's transaction. Bob doesn't. If Alice wins, Charlie's transaction gets added to the chain. Bob wins. Charlie's transaction is not in the batch that gets added to the chain. Now, what happens to Charlie's transaction if, we, if there's a block that is added that does not include that transaction? Is it negated? No, it's not. What happens is this transaction, and these transactions that were being attempted to be mined by another miner who didn't win, go back to the mempool and wait for miners to pick them again. So once the miner wins the race and compiles a valid block, the block joins the end of the chain permanently. So the construction of a blockchain is what makes it unique. So what exactly are confirmations? Confirmations are just blocks stacked on top of each other. And what that does, it solidifies the position of 
other blocks in the chain. A blockchain can't be amended, it can't be appended. What you have to do in order to do so, basically have to, in order to get to this block, you would have to rewind the blockchain. Take apart these blocks, then change your transaction, then try to build off of that. It's uh, extremely impractical, uh, probably impossible. Um, so the more confirmations that are passed, the more blocks stacked on top of your block, the higher the chance that that temporary fork situation isn't going to happen and your block is going to become part of the main chain. So these confirmations have practical uses. If you have a bunch of confirmations, you can be confident that your transaction is going to stay part of that blockchain and not be sent back to the mempool because of a temporary fork. So let's say you're selling something. Here's a practical application. You're not, if you're selling a house, you're going to want to wait for as many confirmations as needed, which is about six. After six confirmations, it is a mathematical, almost a mathematical certainty that your block will actually be added to the chain. So let's say you're buying a car or a house. The seller might require six confirmations in order for that transaction to, for them to honor that transaction, just so they make sure that that block stays part of the chain and it doesn't get discarded and then they're out of their cryptocurrency. So waiting six uh, confirmations basically solves this problem. Um, the problem is you have to wait. So let's say you're selling a cup of coffee. It's $2.50. It's not practical to wait six confirmations, which would last up to an hour, um, in order to buy that cup of coffee. You might um, only rely on one confirmation in order to feel confident enough to sell that coffee. So why wait for confirmations if a block has already been added to the chain? Again, there's that slight possibility of the blockchain temporarily forking and then trying to add two blocks at once. Eventually, during the next few blocks, one chain will be built upon and the other will be discarded back to the mempool. This is a rather rare occurrence, but it definitely shows it's a good idea to wait for six confirmations when interacting with large values. So, money got excited when I pulled the miner out and said that miners compete for a reward. Uh, let's examine the profitability. Because again, there is that energy trade-off. Miners consume a lot of energy, energy costs money. You help to offset that by gaining more Bitcoin, more value in Bitcoin than you are expending in that energy. Most of the time, mining right now is not profitable. Additionally, you need to manage, it's, it's just a big cost benefit. The amount that you're bringing in in block rewards, cryptocurrency, has to outweigh the amount that you are spending in electricity, equipment, any other maintenance, that type of thing. So right now it's more cost efficient to buy Bitcoin directly than the cost of the electricity uh, needed for mining in order to try to earn it. Another really important part of the Bitcoin network is actually something that people usually do not like, and that's transaction fees. My argument, I believe that transaction fees are completely necessary on the Bitcoin network and other blockchains. Let me explain why. There's no transaction fee. What's discouraging somebody from just going out there and randomly sending a million transactions on the network, grinding it to a standstill? There's no downside if there are no fees. If there are fees, well, that attack is going to cost somebody money. It's going to deter that attack. So these transaction fees really act as a spam control mechanism. So in times of higher network traffic, a higher fee will most likely be required to get your transaction mined. So the network is busy, you're probably going to pay higher uh, of a fee than if the network is not busy. However, most of the time, these fees are still, uh, still amount to under a dollar often in times of normal network traffic, uh, or even a little bit higher, and can cost as much as a few, or as little as a few cents. Another thing about fees, it's really important to note that Fees aren't calculated by the amount of value being transacted, but the amount of resources it takes to process that data. So a simple transaction for $10 and a simple transaction for $1,000 uh, really takes the, really will uh, render the same fee for the sender. 
uh, just because the amount of trans uh, data being processed is relatively the same, despite the values. So where do fees end up? Remember we uh, just went over miners compiling transactions into a block, and miners get to pick which transactions are included. Well, what transactions do miners pick? The ones with the highest fees, because miners get to keep those fees on top of that block reward. So it's only logical they're going to pick the transactions with the highest fees to include in their block, so they get the block reward and those fees. It's almost like, I don't know how many people have been to an amusement park, but there is something called a fast pass, which basically lets you jump the line if you're willing to pay more. Um, this situation kind of applies because let's say you attach a big fee to your transaction because you really want to go through, uh, it's likely that the miner is going to see that say, hey, I want that money, and include your transaction in their block. In addition to the fast pass analogy, a better example might be an Uber surcharge. Uh, at times of high traffic where demand is outpacing supply, there's a surcharge and you're going to have to pay more. Uh, in times of high network traffic, you're going to have to pay more in the form of a fee in order to get your transaction mined in a timely manner. So now that we know a little bit about fees, we can examine a unique feedback relationship that will ultimately lead us to the answer, how is Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency introduced into the ecosystem? So at the origin of Bitcoin, the first blocks were happened to be mined by Satoshi, the first few blocks. The block reward was originally 50 Bitcoin. Tokens are created every single time a block is created. So how are new Bitcoins created? Well, through the network subsidy known as block rewards that the miners get when they win that race and put forth a valid block. The amount of Bitcoin that enters the ecosystem is already laid out in the protocols. And probably, we'll get into a couple of those rules after we go through all the steps of the cycle. But why, again, are block rewards there? To reward miners, to incentivize miners to contribute to the network to form valid blocks. So the second step after a block is created, cryptocurrency is then generated. Now, why is this separate than the first step? Shouldn't you get your money and as soon as you create a block if you're a miner? Not necessarily. Remember that situation where we had a temporary fork, where you had two blocks to get solved at the same time. You can't give out two block rewards, especially to one uh, block that is ultimately going to be discarded and then added to the chain. So what happens is your reward gets locked for six confirmations in order to determine which part of the chain is built upon. If your part of the chain is built upon, you get that reward. It's released after six confirmations. If you uh, are on the losing side of a temporary fork, you do not ultimately get any cryptocurrency because you can't give out two block rewards. So after this, and this, isn't, this doesn't happen to all cryptocurrency generated by miners, but like what we said, Cryptocurrency, mining cryptocurrency, is a very energy intensive process. A lot of users at this point, they take some of their tokens, keep them, but many will sell off a portion, or all of them, to recover their electricity costs. Now what does this do? This generates more transactions, generates more transaction fees, and the cycle repeats. A couple things with the cycle that we have to note that has to do with the issuance of Bitcoin. Difficulty adjustment. So remember there's this math problem, this super complex math problem that only mining uh, hardware can solve. The goal is that a Bitcoin block is to be found every 10 minutes. Now this doesn't work on a 10 minute timer. No, instead, the math problem that is put forth is designed to take these computers as close to 10 minutes to solve as possible. This doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes blocks take five minutes to find, sometimes they take 15. Now, every two weeks, the block production rate is examined, and if it's above 10%, or excuse me, if it's above 10 minutes, the difficulty 
is lowered, so it's easier to find blocks closer to that 10 minute time. Let's say the opposite situation is happening and uh, instead the difficulty is too easy. People are uh, finding blocks too quick. But what happens here is the difficulty is going to increase in order to make sure that you get back to those 10 minute block times. Another protocol uh, specification is reward halving. Like I said, Satoshi's original blocks that he mined to start the network with was 50 Bitcoin. And that has since halved twice. It halves every four years. Uh, 210,000 blocks, which roughly amounts to four years. Um, original B uh, reward was 50 BTC, has halved twice, was at 12.5, is now at 6.25, because we've had one more halving that just occurred this summer. Uh, this, what this does effectively for the economy, it controls inflation. It also prolongs the release of Bitcoin because eventually Bitcoin has a finite supply. There's going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever issued, and that's it. It has a hard cap. Uh, what reducing block reward does is it moves the time that you're going to reach this hard cap back. It kind of prolongs the production. Once all the Bitcoin is issued, fees will sustain the network. Miners will work to collect fees instead of a uh, collecting fees and a block reward. 